coming up on this episode of Iowa Life. Follow along with a history professor who hiked across the state. I was changed more than perhaps any place on earth. What if I went and tried to retrace the route of the 1835 Dragoons? Meet a couple who raise peacocks near Minden. And I was mesmerized by these birds. We've had these birds since probably 1981. Learn about a Dubuque organization that offers educational opportunities to adult immigrants. And the friendships that developed between that tutor and that English language learner was life-giving. It's all coming up next on Iowa Life. Funding for Iowa Life is provided by the Gilchrist Foundation. Founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Mark and Kay DeCook Charitable Foundation, proud to support programs that highlight the stories about the people and places of Iowa. The Strickler Family, in loving memory of Lois Strickler, to support programs that highlight the importance of Iowa's natural resources on Iowa PBS. And by the Laney Grimm Fund for Inclusive Programming at the Iowa PBS Foundation. I never had a pet in my life. And then all of a sudden... Oh, you like to eat them off the ground. Here, have my hand. You know how you like those. And I was mesmerized by these birds. We've had these birds since probably 1981. See, when he gets his wings up, that means he's gonna fly. And it's no different than it was then. I still could sit there and watch them for hours. And then I was taking notes down mm -hmm. while she was saying, are you coming in for supper? <laughs> Do you ever wanna come to eat? Yeah. Do you and ever? Do you exist? How did the peacock farm come to be? Do you well, want to start? Yeah. Yes, he gave me a pig when we were dating and we called up Charlie. So when we got married, we took up with and he grew to about 800 pounds and then he died. We think he got struck by lightning. And then he said, what do you want next? And for some weird reason, I said, peacocks. And I'm glad you didn't say elephants. This is true. We didn't know anything about them. And then we found out when our first peacock, Junior, died, the vet said, oh, she had a bad heart. And mm -hmm. I said, she? He said, yeah, it's a she. I thought, we thought it was a boy. He says, no, I hate to tell you, Junior is a girl. And I said, I got to study this. But nobody would tell us anything, so we learned firsthand. We wrote books. <laughs> we wrote books, and I wrote down everything I could. I took yep. every still shot. As the years went on, we got more and more birds, and then all of a sudden, I was substituting because we were out promoting our first peacock book, which sold out our first thousand copies within the first month. They're like any other barnyard poultry. You feed them cracked corn. Uh, we have oats and wheat here, and we mix those up together, and that's their diet. And they're the only bird in the poultry world that does not lay an egg and is sexually mature until their second and third year. A male will not have his full tail feathers until his third year. Now, if you were to have them, you have to make sure you have space for them. So you have to have a cage that's at least eight foot tall. I do admit that they are able to withstand the heat better than the cold, but they do well in 25 below zero temperatures, which we've experienced over the 37 years. Like other farmers, Dennis and Deborah Fett feed and water their livestock each morning. Among the goose and guineas are their pride and joy. The Fetts are peacock farmers. And this is where it all started. The first TV we ever were on. At the minute the book came out. It actually started with Goosey. <gasps> yes, Goosey David Letterman. You like my left foot, don't you? And the mall in Council Bluffs, I went there and they had a TV thing. I said, hey, I got a goose that unties shoes. 
David Letterman was going to put us on the show, but he said he'd only pay us $50 and we'd have to get our way to New York. And I said, well, we we're kind of poor at this time. And so we didn't go. And then once we got to this place, Peacocks are not as mysterious as everybody's led to the believe. The big thing happened was Iowa Public TV, they came back in 1988 to film us for Take One series. So we lost our favorite pet, and then I was about ready to give it up, and I think Deb encouraged me. Said, and from then on in, people saw us all over the state, and then we were invited to, was it Davenport to be on TV? Yeah. We were invited to Kansas City. Yeah. And we did all the TV stations in Des Moines. We did stuff. We, we promoted our books at the Iowa State Fair. The wacky world of peafowl. That's what we're going to talk about today. I went over to the poultry barn this morning, Deborah. That's someplace you've been a number of times, right? Oh, yeah. We used to enter all the time. We got tired of winning, so we quit entering. Did you hear that? Part? We did a promo for today's show. Yeah. Good morning, America. <laughs> Hi, I'm Deborah Buck. Hi, I'm Dennis Fett. We're here on a peacock farm in Minden, Iowa. Good, Good morning, America. America! From the Minden, Iowa peacock farm, we know what a difference today makes. It was crazy, and it was just like... Constant. People found us, and I promoted, but I could never get that. It just, it just snowballed. Magazines, radio. Oh, That's yeah. I, I think we, we have a total of perhaps four hours of airtime of all our Peacock stories. I got a DVD of it. Mm -hmm. I was a music teacher. I started off as a band teacher in South Dakota, then came to Iowa, how I met her. We dated for three years and got married. Now, I'm a good clarinet player. I, I've taught for many years, but I'm not a songwriter. Mm -hmm. About 1989, we were at the Iowa State Fair and we saw this gospel group on That's the right. Bill Riley stage. Mm -hmm. And I was so inspired by them. Mm -hmm. And I went home that night after the fair, and I woke up in the middle of the night and heard a song in my head. I went down, got my cassette recorder, I hummed it into the recorder, and the next morning I woke up, I said, I think I had a dream I wrote a Peacock <laughs> song. And I said, can you write words to this song? She says, yeah. And the next day she had words, and it is the Wacky Peacock song. Yep. On one hot and sunny We flew out from Omaha, Nebraska to LaGuardia Airport with four peacocks. We did a seven minute segment where we talked about peacocks. We walked around the cage and we sang our peacock song. And from then on in, it was crazy. Oh, oh yes, we got peacocks. Lots and lots of peacocks. We got black shoulder white and India blue. Then I got invited to be on the animal planet, You Lie Like a Dog, where I was the peacock expert and the guy next to me wasn't. But you yeah. were on the Tonight Show. Well, yeah, we did the Tonight the Show. show. It is from yeah. Minden, Iowa. Minden. Please welcome Dennis Fett. Dennis, come on out here. I got a call to say, can you play Jingle Bells on your clarinet in 28 seconds and take it apart where I have a disappearing clarinet? I said, yeah. And they flew me out and I did it. And I talked about peacocks, they cut it out. But that's okay. Here we are, yep. I'm a YouTube guy now, and I love making videos. Are you ready? Yeah, Get so your, I don't. Got your clipboard? Yeah. You know what you're gonna say? No, nothing. Oh, you can't do that. I'm done. Okay, I, I'll figure it out. Mrs. Peacock, do you have some questions that our viewers sent from our channel? Yes, I do, and the first question is, when it started off, I didn't know anything about it. We were videotaping. I had an old-fashioned camcorder, VHS, and I was running around. I went from still pictures, which I love with our books, to video. Maybe I need the GoPro you this morning. You're going to scream so I can get a good GoPro of you? I kept making videos, and then I learned about YouTube, didn't know what it was, and I put videos up and had a Peacock video that's now almost 2 million views, Peacock yelling. And it's probably my worst video that I think I've ever taken, but the best part about it is, is Debbie's in the beginning of it. Trying to do a stand-up for one of our DVDs we made, and the peacock <laughs> wouldn't let her talk and hear her speak. And I put that in. Yep. Apparently, she always claims it's because of her, yeah. and I, I agree. Of course. Welcome to Mr. Peacock and Friends. I wonder what Mr. Peacock will be doing today. Let's we, find out. we average about 29 to 30,000 views a month. 
I really don't care. I just make videos and like I said, I'm an educator. If people find them an interest, fine. If not, who cares? <laughs> I grew up in a concrete jungle in Patterson, New Jersey, and I never thought in my dreams that I'd even have five feet of grass, let alone four acres of what we have here. It's peaceful, but it's fun to watch animals. Animals are so much fun, they all have their personalities. It's like a, a connection with the birds and wildlife and animals. Peacocks never paid the bill. After the book sales dwindled, that was it. By looking inside the egg during the incubation process, you can see what's really happening or not happening. I'm a teacher. I want to teach people about peacocks. I'm just happy to be retired, to be here on the farm and hear the peacocks yelling in the background and enjoying life. They're interesting. From a pig to a peacock to Who would ever think? to songs. I mean, it's endless. Kevin Mason is many things. He's a professor at Waldorf University in Forest City. List 99 state parks and so I was using He has a PhD in rural and environmental history. He's a researcher and writer, a blogger, a documentarian, a camera operator, outdoor enthusiast, and to the core, an Iowan. Today, he has taken his research to Walnut Wood State Park in West Des Moines. He's in the middle of a project to document the development and history of all 83 state parks in Iowa. This is part of a bigger research project for me on public lands where I'll go through. Um... Documenting all of the state parks in Iowa may sound like an ambitious task, but it's nothing new for Kevin. In 2021, he made his way from Montrose to Minnewaukon, a total of 371 miles, all by foot. I have a better idea of what I'm trying to work on, where last summer it's like, I don't know, I had no idea what I was doing. So what compelled this history professor to take his research for a hike? The idea for the walk across Iowa started actually during the Iowa State Fair in a garage on the uh, north side of Des Moines, in the Merle Hay neighborhood, uh, at my sister's house where I was uh, talking uh, with her partner who's a high school social studies teacher and he, he goes, oh, you gotta read this book. Albert Lee wrote this journal in 1835 with this military expedition called the Dragoons that went across Iowa we should do it. And it became kind of this running joke as a lot of things like this tend to be. But in my training as an environmental historian, one of the things stuck out in my mind was that I was changed more than perhaps any place on earth. 98% of Iowa's land surface changed from 1835 through the conversion of agriculture until now. What if I went and tried to retrace the route of the 1835 Dragoons, which in doing so created this incredible source base that gives us a snapshot of what Iowa looks like in 1835 at the moment before uh, Americanization and the conversion to agriculture begins. And so just decided to go for it. Hello, Kevin here with Notes on Iowa. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about day four of my walk so across the big things Iowa. that stood out to me on the river. The importance of the river was really driven home to it. It had been a very hot uh, previous eight days as I made my way from Prairie City. Uh, all For 21 days, Kevin set out along the Des Moines River to retrace the historic route. Rain, heat, and country roads all turned into unique challenges all while trying to record his observations, capture video, fly a drone, and log and document the route. There was a part of this that was about me proving to myself that I could do it, um, and, and that this was a thing uh, that I was going to be committed 
uh, to seeing all the way through, no matter what that might look like. So, I made it. I had a crazy idea. Um, I started to... After his journey, Kevin found a new appreciation for the changes which define the past, present, and future of Iowa. And that appreciation continues to expand. It's selfish to say, like, it's kind of doing this, like, for me. And then it really became about other people a lot of the time. I remember I was down by Eddyville on this gravel road, and I just walked up this giant hill. And it was kind of the point where, like, all right, I'm just out here walking. And this guy stopped. We ended up having this conversation, and he uh, kind of turned to me after we were talking, and he goes, I've lived here my whole life, and I've never thought about any of those things but I'm gonna go check out the Buxton location where that coal mining town used to be because you told me it was just over here. And opening those doors, and that's a real conversation in real time, but opening uh, kind of that up, that's been one of the parts of this that's been something I didn't really expect at all. People really care about the places they're from and the history that's close to them. It forces me to really be careful in my research, be respectful of people's viewpoints, people's experiences. And so it forces me to constantly be keeping in mind that it's not just some abstract thing I'm talking about, that the past is real and it influences the moment we're in, and that people uh, remember these things. And that's where I think like Notes is actually going is, I know I wanna just keep pushing myself to learn new things, to better understand this place and then to communicate that to other people. That could look like a lot of different things in the future and I'm sure it will if I'm lucky enough. For me, it was darkness, totally darkness. I didn't know how to act. Language was just the first barrier, because communication is essential. So for me, it was totally darkness, and I was scared, scared to go out, scared to talk and make a mistake. You travel in a foreign country, you can have a million dollars in your pocket. You don't have the language, you're disadvantaged. I remember starting out, and I hadn't lived in Dubuque for a while, and I was looking for places. I had a car, I had a phone, and English was my first language, and I couldn't find the places. If the resources are there, but they're hard to find, then there, there's a correction that needs to happen. We opened our doors about 20 years ago, 2002, when the Pope in the 90s talked about how there was just an influx of refugees from all over the world that you know needed to start over again, needed to rebuild their lives, he made an appeal to people that we needed to welcome them, you know, and develop places that could do that and, and find out what do they need most and how can we meet those needs. The Lantern Center came out of a decision of the sisters at the presentation saying oh, we wanted to um, take another step and especially with a sensitivity to women and children. Nothing against men, but oftentimes they're the poorest and hungriest people in the cities and on the planet. That's understanding English. And the plan that evolved was one-on-one -on -one tutoring, which was really an important piece because friendships develop. And the friendships that developed between that tutor and that English language learner was life-giving. We were lucky. My husband has a job opportunity, so we can be here. Yeah. He is bilingual, I wasn't. To be honest, I was very, very scared. 
just to go out and I was scared people ask me something like doctor's appointments or when you go to the grocery you act in that way. What did you gain from coming here? Confidence. I came to learn a language and I gained a life. I learned the language, I am able to work, I am able to help the community. Now I can express myself, but also I can be the voice for the ones who are newcomers. Sometimes we, we feel alone, and you come into this building, to this place, it just feels so good. It made me feel like this is my home, you know, like they help me with my citizenship, for my English, trying to work in my GD. It is, it is free. That's amazing, you know, that's amazing. They do not pay anything. Everything is free. We have significant support still from the Sisters of the Presentation. And we also have a lot of individual donors. As time goes on, you see people who were originally students with us often eventually come back and want to give back to the Lantern Center as well, whether that's through financial support or often as volunteers too, and that's really satisfying as well. This is our annual picnic from for the Presentation Center volunteer group. So we're honoring the tutors and we've invited all of our teachers and learners and it's just um, a fun time to eat, greet and meet. We cannot thank you enough, you tutors, for all that you do. Let's give everybody a round. When the students come in, I also interview them and find out what their education goals. I do an assessment with them to find out their language level. Are they wanting to gain English so that they can get a better job? Or are they ready to apply for citizenship and they want a tutor to help them? First of all, Lenten Center made me independent and helped me. They realized what is the purpose of life, helped me driving, banking, what is the lifestyle and U.S. culture. Next Wednesday. Learning a language is a, kind of a, like a lifetime process, and I think that they know that kind of we're here for them in different um, steps of their journey. They maybe completely perfected their English in our eyes, but <laughs> they want to move on to the next level. You know, for a lot of people, life is hard, and a little bit of kindness and a little bit of help can make a world of difference. This is a place where three things happen. You're welcomed, you can learn the language, and you have somebody there who's a cultural broker. This is how the system works. This is what you need to know. This is where you go for these resources. And I'm going to be always going to be connected because the center changed my life. I came for English and they changed my life. Good things often come in small packages, but in the case of a collection of books at the University of Iowa, great things here come in small, very small packages. Miniature books, small, intricately detailed works of art that come in different shapes, designs, styles, and of course, sizes. A miniature book is a book that is typically classified as under three inches at the longest side. We have over 4,000 miniature books, I believe, at this point, which is quite a few. That's a book. That's a book. This one's cool because it's housed in a shoe. Some of them do actually have complete text within them, and they were intended to be read. The initial part of this collection was donated by Charlotte Smith 
1996. So this book here, Book Interlude, is the first book that Charlotte and her husband Thomas made. So Charlotte started collecting miniature books when she ran out of room in her library because they took up so much less space. And that's not necessarily the reason that somebody might make a miniature book, but I think it's one of the reasons why somebody might collect them. It's a collection of small miniature portraits. We have things from the 17th century all the way up to the present. A lot of the things that I'm finding when cataloging are um, works by famous authors that are just produced in a miniature book form. They rescued this tiny little set of Shakespeare books, which was in this bookcase. This one is really one of my favorites. So I think it's a great way to get people interested in reading and to get people interested in special collections and what we have here at the University of Iowa Libraries. Funding for Iowa Life is provided by the Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Mark and Kay DeCook Charitable Foundation, proud to support programs that highlight the stories about the people and places of Iowa. The Strickler Family, in loving memory of Lois Strickler, to support programs that highlight the importance of Iowa's natural resources on Iowa PBS, and by the Laney Grimm Fund for Inclusive Programming at the Iowa PBS Foundation.